It is a pleasure to be here. The last time I was in London was, I think, 11 years ago. And I was at a, a conference with a group that, that deals generally with other types of ethical issues than the issue of sexuality. But they brought a number of us up from America and elsewhere to speak. And then on the last day, we had an opportunity as a free day to do what we wanted to do. So of course, my choice was to go to the British Museum and see all the things that the Brits had stolen over the years <laughs> from Greece and Rome and Egypt. And I, I, you know, they should have administered a sedative to me before I started because it was just too much stimulation all at once, <laughs> dashing from room to room and uh, just unbelievable. That, in my mind, certainly the greatest museum in the world, just unbelievable stuff. So anyway, a pleasure to be here. I um, have really had great hospitality shown to me so far, which as you can imagine, I don't always get in every venue that I go to. So I'm always appreciative. And in, in uh, venues like this, I store up energy for other venues, which are a little bit more, let's say, hostile to my viewpoint. Um, I know that you've had a those of you who are in the Anglican Communion have had the Pilling Report, and that the basic argument of that report with regard to scripture is because there are people who disagree about how to use the biblical witness on the issue of homosexual practice, that therefore we have to push the biblical evidence off to one side. Uh, let me suggest to you that there have always been biblical scholars disagreeing on everything. Okay, that doesn't mean we push it off to one side. Uh, the best arguments win. And you can't just say everything is relatively equal. And what I'm going to present in this first part is, I, I don't even have time to get into most of the Old Testament witness. I'd love to get into you the text of Sodom and read it in its literary and historical context. I'd love to talk to you about the story, similar story about the Levite at Gibeah. I'd love to talk to you about the stories, the texts about the Kadashim, the cult figures, uh, males pass, who perform the duty of passive receptive role in man-male intercourse in a cultic context. I'd like to talk to you about Ezekiel's use of it. I'd like to point out to you that every text in scripture that has anything to do with sexual ethics, whether it be narrative, legal material, proverbs, poetry, metaphor, always, without exception, presupposes a male-female requirement. In other words, this is not just one uh, minor issue within the biblical text on sexual ethics. This is the foundation for all discussion of sexual ethics in scripture. It's by no means a minor point. Uh, I'm not going to comment on, on yea or nay on whether or not you hold a view about scripture being inerrant or infallible. I try to make a case for the lowest common denominator. That is, does scripture mean anything? How do we deal with core values in the biblical text? Does Jesus' view about sex mean anything? You see, I'm dealing with a very low common denominator here. Uh, you do not have to be an inerrantist in order to see what I'm saying here. It's scripture's evidence, scripture's view on homosexual practice is overwhelmingly one-sided. And one-sided here in a good sense, in alignment with the truth of God's word. So with that, we're going to start by looking at the Genesis text. So that is the one part of the Old Testament I will key in on. Then follow it up with Jesus. And in the second half... After lunch, we will look at Paul and alleged new knowledge arguments regarding committed homosexual relationships and orientation theory in the ancient world and the use of analogies. At least that's the theory, okay? So let's see how it goes here. Uh, I'm from Lowell, Massachusetts originally. The actress Betty Davis from many years ago was from Lowell, Massachusetts, and in one movie all about Eve, she tells everybody, fasten your seatbelts. I think this is going to be a bumpy ride. Well, that may exactly be what happens here. Starting with Genesis 1, to 1, particularly uh, the middle section on Genesis 1, And God created the Adam. Now, Adam here is not a gender-specific term. It's referring to human beings in a gender-undifferentiated way. So God created the Adam, the human, 
the earthling, if you will, Adam from Adama, meaning ground, in his image. And in the image of God, he created it, or him, male and female, he created them. Now, what does that tell us about issues of human sexuality? For one, it tells us that the image of God is extant in male-female complementarity, namely that human beings image a facet of God as male and female. Uh, that uh, the creation in God's image is not unrelated to sexual activity. While it is true that animals are also made in Genesis 1 as male and female, as you well know, that maleness and femaleness is not integrated uh, into, their, into a creation in God's image, which of course only accompanies humans who are made in God's image. We have a lovely little dog, Benji, who is a Morkie, part Maltese, part Yorkshire Terrier, but I've never derived my sexual ethics from Benji because Benji is not very discriminating, I've discovered, when it comes to sexual ethic concerns. But God doesn't hold that against Benji because Benji is not made in God's image. We, however, are. Implication that male and female here are angled expressions of God's image, part of a two-faceted sexual whole. Now, in this context, procreation, of course, is one element of male-female complementarity, be fruitful and multiply, according to Genesis 1.28 but it's by no means the only element. In fact, the context emphasizes structural congruity or uh, compatibility as regards kinds. So it involves considerations beyond any personal affect or orientation. That is, the structures of our embodied existences are critical as male and female. And the emphasis here is on male-female compatibility not on male dominance. It's not a misogynistically based viewpoint. Even more important is the text from Genesis 2, talking about the creation of woman. Yahweh God said, it's not good for the Adam or human to be alone. I will make for him a helper as his counterpart. We'll come back to that terminology of counterpart in a moment. But for the Adam, there was not found a helper as a counterpart, as you know, among animals. And Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human, and he slept. And he took one of his se'aim, Hebrew term, which you usually see rendered as ribs, but which I'm going to make a case for as sides in a moment. And he closed up its place with flesh. And Yahweh God built the Salah, the side or rib, that he had taken from the human or Adam, uh, and built it up into a woman and brought her to the Adam or human. And the Adam or human said, this at last is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. To this one shall be given the name Isha, woman, for from an Ish, man, this one was taken. Somewhat retrojected back, Sexual, sexually differentiated in view of now what has been extracted. Therefore, an ish, a man, shall leave his father and mother and become attached or joined or stuck or united to his woman or wife, the isha, and they, or with all the versional, i.e. non-Hebrew evidence, that is Septuagint, Samaritan Pentateuch, Aramaic Targums, Vulgate, the two shall become one flesh, now that phrase about becoming attached or joined or stuck to, here's where prepositions are important. You don't want to go back home and say, honey, I learned today that I'm stuck with you. No, not with, stuck to, stuck to. Very critical here, use of prepositions. Now, the meaning of selah here, this word that is normally rendered rib in this text. You actually go to the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, many, many volumes, about Hebrew words and their interpretation, you'll find that in the entry uh, on Selah, that the author notes that if Selah does mean rib in Genesis 2, 21 to 22, it does so only in this one passage and not in the 36 other occurrences 
in the Hebrew Bible. This semantic singularity, of course, suggests that one seek a different solution, which is precisely what I do. In 2 Samuel 16, Selah refers to the side of a hill. Everywhere else, Selah refers to the side of a piece of sacral architecture, whether that be the side of the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle or the incense altar, or the side of the Solomonic Temple, or the side of the eschatological temple in Ezekiel. In short, and actually the author of the entry in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament also makes this point, namely human beings are sacral architecture, including in their sexuality. That is, what we do sexually matters to God. It threatens to either enhance or efface that stamp of the divine image on our being that has bearing on our sexuality. Paul makes a similar point in 1 Corinthians 6 when still talking about the case of the incestuous man begun in 1 Corinthians 5, he notes that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit that is in us, right? We are sacral architecture. The context of this is discussing sexual ethics. We cannot do what we want in sexual ethics, Paul says, because God has bought us with a price nothing less than the amends-making death of Jesus Christ on our behalf to pay the price for our release. Therefore, God owns us in body and soul. That's why we declare Jesus to be Corios, Lord, master of our lives, requiring our obedience to him. So again, confirming, and we actually even have reference also in uh, early Judaism, uh, reference to these texts, for example, from Philo of Alexandria, first century Jew, who talks about referring to these sides that God has used in distinguishing male and female. Uh, and also a similar point is made by rabbis, for example, in the text Genesis Rabbah, which preserves earlier traditions. And both of them conclude that sides are involved here. Uh, they differ over whether or not we're talking about left or right or front or back, does not matter to me, which you go with. The point is sexual other halves, your sexual complement or counterpart, which is the point here in the use of the term that I have translated counterpart. The term is konegdo, which comes from the Hebrew ka meaning as or like, a suffix o meaning his, and the preposition neged, Interesting preposition because it can mean both corresponding to, that is denoting similarity here with regard to being a fellow human being, and at the same time can denote difference, opposite. Here, of course, as regards sex or gender. Therefore, it's the perfect term to, for something like counterpart or complement. A man and a woman are each other's sexual counterpart or complement at every level, anatomically, physiologically, and even psychologically. This is why you have people going around talking about men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and they're making lots of money off of that. Well, it's true. Not that we are actually from different planets, but although we may think that once we're married, uh, that we are more different than simply being different individuals. Male and female are genuinely different. I hope I'm not being overly controversial in making that point. Sometimes when I do in previous debates, one of my earliest debates with a, a woman New Testament scholar uh, on this issue, when I made that point, subsequently we went out to dinner with the senior pastor and the associate pastor, and she kept, she just couldn't get over this point that I thought that there was, in some respects, men and women were different. And the two male pastors are just roll, doubles up in laughter, rolling off their chair. I'm saying, guys, we have to try to be serious here. But they couldn't contain themselves. Yes, men and women are indeed different. There is an emphasis in this short context of 2, 21 to 24 on this taking from the human or dom. Something is extracted from him. Four times this point is stressed in each one of the verses from 21 to 24. In each verse, that element that something is extracted from the human. That means there is now a missing element to this human, right? Point being here that what is missing from the human now, and ish, after the extraction, 
is the part that God has built into a woman. In short, in the context, one flesh clearly implies the restoring of the missing part to the indivisible whole. With the extraction, you've started with the one, you've extracted the side, you now have two, and the two must reunite to form, reform the one. These are transcendent primeval realities that are being conveyed by imagery in the text. How literal or metaphorical to take it is anybody's guess. We can only say, though, that there is a fundamental point here that being made, ma namely that man and woman are two essential complementary parts in a holistic picture of human sexuality. You can't fake gender complementarity as if, though, by a man becoming particularly effeminate, he may do the job of a woman, or a woman, by being masculinized, uh, may replace a man. You can't fake gender complementarity. You either have it or you don't. You're either a male or, or you're not, a female or you're not. One flesh here thus does not mean, contrary to what some people have argued, simply the same family, but rather the restoration of the sexual whole. The image here of one flesh becoming two sexes, that extraction from the original Adam and forming that into a woman, and then rejoining, is the principle that gra grounds the principle for the two sexes becoming one flesh. Two sexes become one flesh because together they unite to form an integrated, indivisible whole. Marriage is thus viewed as a reconstitution of the divided parts. Same-sex erotic unions would then be precluded structurally because you're not bringing together, you're not restoring that whole by again reuniting male and female. Homoerotic unions would require a very different kind of creation account. For example, the tale spun by Aristophanes in Plato's Symposium where God gets married at the human race at that point, which consists of a binary man-male, uh, female-female, and man-woman. God splits each of them, and thereafter the one you emanate from most determines what your sexual orientation will be. That is not the kind of creation story we have told in Genesis 2. And again here, there's no element of misogyny. Uh, the uh, man, Ish, is hardly holding his nose when he's saying, this is bone for my bones, flesh for my flesh, I mean, there's great joy being uttered here at reuniting with his sexual counterpart or other half. And Genesis 3.16, as you know, attributes a husband's rule to the fall. That's part of the fall, not part of the pre-fall existence. Um, so does Genesis 2.24 stress only sameness? Important here also to note creation stories elsewhere in the ancient Near East. For example, in the tale of the Atrahasis epic, where human males and human females, are each seven pairs of each, are formed separately from a dead god, uh, the blood of a dead god mixed with clay. There's a lovely little story there. And there, there's not an extraction from the one, creating two halves of the original whole but there is in the Genesis account. In other words, the Genesis account is making a point of male-female complementarity over against a view in, the Mes in Mesopotamia and elsewhere in the ancient Near East that does not make a point of that, of the two being part of a whole, each one half. So it's part of a deliberate emphasis. There are also texts from early Judaism that emphasize the point that woman is part of man. You know, here from Second Temple Judaism, for example, 4th Maccabees, 18.7. There's a great little story about the uh, tale of, of the uh, martyrs, the mother and her seven sons, being asked to apostatize in relation to Jewish law, which they refused to do. And the mother, before she uh, is tortured to death, shouts uh, uh, to be slaughtered uh, for the faith. Antiochus, she declares to Antiochus, the persecutor, or his... Uh, lackey who's doing it for him. I was a pure virgin and guarded the side, plura in Greek, or rib that had been built up 
i.e. from the man. She understands herself as a constituent part of a larger gender whole. Or, for example, telling the story about Adam of Eve in the Apocalypse of Moses, where Eve asks Adam to kill her because of what she has done in terms of obeying, heeding the uh, words of the snake, so that God and his angels will no longer be angry with him. With Adam responding, I can't let you take the blame completely from that. Why should I bring death to my side against the image that God has made? We're part of the same being. We come from the same integrated whole. What happens to you must happen to me, in effect. And Eve's death is subsequently portrayed as a time when Adam's side or rib would return to him. Now, here's a picture illustrating male-female differences. I've checked this out with my wife. She's given me the improper interpretation of this. On the top, we have the man, a simplistic being with a single button. Below, we have woman, far more complex, far better at multitasking, as my wife has put it, than men have as a capacity. Okay, the witness of Jesus, silence of the lamb, little cinematic echo there. Uh, there isn't really a silence of the lamb on this issue. Jesus actually does speak volumes about a male-female requirement for sexual ethics. Of course, the key Jesus sex text is in Mark 10 with a parallel in Matthew 19, where the Pharisees ask him a question about whether it's permissible for a man to divorce his wife, testing him. This causes Jesus to respond with a view to your hardness of heart. Moses wrote to you this command. There's an interesting hermeneutical principle here. That is a principle about interpreting biblical texts that we will come back to later. But from the beginning of creation, male and female, he made them, citing just that one third of Genesis 1:27 and then following up immediately with Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his woman or wife, and the two will become one flesh. We've already looked at that text. Jesus concludes, so they are no longer two, but one, one flesh. What then God has yoked together, let no man, let no human separate. And then there's further discussion about divorce, remarriage, of course, in that context. What we learn from this text is that Jesus has a back-to-creation model for human sexuality. Jesus, in effect, declares that Genesis 1.27 and 2.24 are normative for defining human sexual ethics, and they have prescriptive, i.e., prohibitional uh, implications arising from it. Uh, so we don't mean simply here normative in the sense that, well, this is the normal way of doing things, but we can make lots of exceptions. Normative in the sense that to do otherwise violates God's prohibitions that are involved or related to these texts. So for the Pilling Report to say that we have to leave Scripture to one side, when Jesus himself says, this is the foundation for sexual ethics, this is what I your Lord regard as foundational for sexual ethics. Well, draw your own conclusions as to whether or not that is a faithful response to Jesus. Marriage for Jesus is an institution ordained not by human beings to tinker with at will, to make all sorts of manner of adjustments, even to the very foundation but rather it is an institution ordained by the Creator involving one man and one woman in a lifelong indissoluble union. In this context, Jesus emphasizes the two-ness of the sexual bond. In effect, he prohibits both the revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause and implicitly polygamy because polygamy is the easier element to prohibit. Just as in our own society, we prohibit polygamy, but we don't prohibit remarriage after divorce, okay? 
Remarriage after divorce for any cause is a sort of a uh, serial form of polygamy. So we could perhaps distinguish between concurrent polygamy, polygamy proper, and serial polygamy. Question is, where does Jesus get this number two to limit the number of partners in a sexual union to two in this context? Because that's his whole, his whole argument against a revolving door of divorce and remarriage is you're still married to the original partner. So therefore, if you have sex with somebody other than that original married partner, you are committing adultery. You can only be committing adultery if you're still married to the original partner. And the inference of all of that is that God has limited the sexual union to two, which then become one. So where does Jesus then get this number two? It's just like pulling a rabbit out of a hat magically. It's somewhat arbitrary choice of numbers. You're going to the deli and uh, you draw the number two, but it could have been any other number. No, that isn't the point at all. What is the one point in common between Genesis 1.27 and really the only the one third of Genesis 1.27 that Jesus cites? Male and female, he made them, and Genesis 2.24. Well, since you don't have a lot of text in the one third of Genesis 1.27 that Jesus cites, it's pretty easy to figure out what the point is in common between these two texts that causes Jesus to link them. Anyone want to guess? Where does he get two? What are there two of? Two sexes or genders, right? Male and female, man and woman. Deliberately designed by God in creation as such. In short, the two-ness of the sexes for Jesus is the foundation for the two-ness of the sexual bond. Jesus arrives at a conclusion about the number of partners allowable in a sexual union, whether at any one time or serially, and does so on the basis of a deliberate creation on God's part of two primary sexes in sexual union. In other words, by that reasoning, third parties are neither necessary nor desirable. Because once you brought together the two halves of the sexual spectrum and you have an integrated sexual whole, what else are you waiting for? A third party isn't needed. You've already achieved wholeness, sexually speaking, by bringing together the two into one. Now, some have argued, well, Jesus isn't saying anything about that. And you can't demonstrate that from anything within Jesus' current cultural context. Au contraire. Yes, we can. There's a group called the Essenes, a sectarian group in early Judaism. As the Pharisees are a sectarian group, as the Sadducees are a sectarian group. By sectarian, we mean not necessarily cult-like in the way that we're talking about today, but an organized movement within a larger movement. And the Essenes are so rigorous in their observance of the Mosaic law that they believe that the Pharisees were wimps when it came to observing the law of Moses. Okay? In other words, their critique of the Pharisees is that the Pharisees were not rigorous enough in observing the law. Is that the picture you see of the Pharisees in the Gospels? It's the exact opposite, right? The Pharisees are too strict, too rigid. For the Essenes, they're not strict and rigid enough. They're too lax. And the Essenes adopted a view opposed to polygamy. In the Damascus Covenant text, they say they rejected taking two wives in their lives because, quote, the foundation of creation, catch that word, foundation. The foundation of creation is male and female, he created them. That same one-third of Genesis 127 that Jesus would cite a uh, century and a half later. That particular phrase, Saka unakeva in Hebrew, male and female, is found nowhere after the Noah's Ark narratives, only up to that point in the Old Testament. You would think it would be all over the place, but it's just Genesis 1 through 9, that's it. 
And in the context of the Noah's Ark narratives, it's associated with this element of two, going into the ark two by two. Why two by two? Because the Essenes are saying, see, there's a sort of self-contained two-ness to the sexual bond by virtue of the fact that God deliberately ordained two primary sexes. In effect, for them, the two-ness of the sexes is the basis for the two-ness of the sexual bond. What Jesus does differently from them is where the Essenes stopped at prohibiting polygamy, Jesus went further than they went, prohibiting a revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause. That's not something that the Essenes went so far to do, but that's something Jesus did. So Jesus leapfrogged over the easier thing to prohibit, the polygamy, and ended up prohibiting the hardest thing of all, serial polygamy taking in the concurrent polygamy at the same time and outdoing the most rigorous sexual ethicists in early Judaism. Far from Jesus expressing greater openness to sexual expression, what Jesus was in effect doing is closing the remaining loopholes. Three corollaries follow from this. Back to creation model of sexual ethics for Jesus. Number one, Old Testament law does not always reflect God's perfect will. I love that when I'm debating somebody on the other side of this issue, um, as I did recently with Bishop Burroughs in Ireland, Ireland, and I love when they make the point that Jesus takes us away from some Old Testament text. I say, beautiful. That's a point with which I agree with you. Now look at the direction in which Jesus takes it. In other words, Jesus said that Moses accommodated male hardness of heart. Men, did you know that in the United States there was a federally funded study of 15,000 people around the world, first world, third world, industrial societies, tribal societies, and they came to the astounding conclusion, hold on to your hats here, that men find monogamy more difficult than women. I don't know why they just didn't phone me in my office. You could have saved them a lot of time. I'd have told them. These are your tax dollars working hard for you. What would we do without experts, right? This is a cross-cultural phenomenon. It's also, in many respects, a cross-species phenomenon, right? This is not meant to be rocket science or brain surgery. It's pretty obvious, right? And Moses gave an accommodation to men that was not given to women because they realized such things in the ancient world. The ancients are not as dumb as we think they are over a host of issues. Uh, And yet, what Jesus said is, that's a loophole given in the law of Moses that now I'm going to close. So liberals are right about the fact that there is change between the two covenants, but they're wrong about the direction. The direction is to make the sexual ethics of the people of God more coherent and consistent with the will of God expressed in creation, which is a will that deems a male-female prerequisite to all sexual relationships as foundational. That's the movement for the change. Whereas now the church is moving in the opposite direction, against what Jesus declares consistent with the witness of the creation text to be foundational, and yet they continue to call Jesus Koryos. Lord. But when Jesus declares something of central significance to himself, something as foundational to his understanding of human sexuality, and we declare that to be something that we can completely change at the foundation, I will submit to you, we are no longer, whatever we confess to say, regarding Jesus as Lord. And the church has left its own Lord and ceases to be a valid structure for representing that particular denomination, for representing the church to the world. That's what's at danger here. Heresy, by the way, is not just doctrinal. Uh, the word, Greek word hierasis simply means choice. It's often used for a course of life or even behavior. Greco-Roman discourse in antiquity is oriented around behavior. Philosophy is very much behaviorally oriented. And you may know that those who construct a view about accepting committed homosexual unions, they develop a whole theology around that. 
They develop communities around that. People are defined as in or out on the basis of which they ex or whether or not they accept that theology. It fits all the earmarks of a religious movement. And it is a religious movement in antithesis to Jesus' own message about sexual ethics. It is, in every way, shape, and form, heresy. And it is the job of the leadership of the church to guard against heresy. When you look at the pastoral epistles, the one essential duty above all other duties of overseers slash bishops, the episcopoi, or the presbyteroi, the elders, which at this time is viewed as one, I believe, only separated later in Ignatius and others as we move through into the second century, their primary job is to guard the deposit of truth entrusted to us, which very much, if you read the pastoral epistles, has to do with ethical behavior. There's a theological component behind it, to be sure, but it results in a certain way of living which the overseers and elders must guard against. If they do not guard against it, they have invalidated their office and no longer have a right to be in the leadership of the church because that's the one requirement most important for their office. Sadly now, it's with the leadership that we are struggling. And the church, if necessary, must rise up against that leadership and not go like sheep over the cliff with them. It is not that leadership that it is Lord. It is Jesus who is Lord. Even Paul said at Corinth, don't align yourself around me, or Cephas, Peter, or Apollos. Who are we? We were not crucified for you. We didn't make amends for your human sin. We were not raised from the dead to inaugurate the new creation. Jesus is your Lord. That's the one to whom you must pay attention to. And if Paul said that about himself, it could actually criticize the people aligned around him. Why should we align around current leadership in the church that is morally heretical? There is no basis for it whatsoever. The people of God must rise up against that. When the gospel was compromised by Peter at Antioch, Paul made a point of saying, I withstood him to his face because he was not walking in a straight line in accordance with the truth of the gospel. Imagine that. I mean, we're talking about Peter here. He gets the name Cephas, Aramaic for rock, because of the tradition that he is the first human being to confess Jesus as the Messiah. The demons have confessed it beforehand. God has said it beforehand at the baptism. The supernatural forces know it, but Peter is the first human to confess it. And for that, he is called the rock. And yet, Peter's had episodes in the past where he had to be rebuked, right? You remember Jesus' pastoral response to Peter when Peter tried to prevent Jesus from going to the cross to make amends for human sin? You remember that pastoral response? What was that now? Let's see. You know, we can agree to disagree, Peter. I respect your view. Your view is equally valid to any other view. Is that it now? Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, I had a temporary senior moment there. That's right, that's right. Get thee behind me, Satan, adversary, because you are now serving at cross purposes with the will of God. If that can be said to Peter, what leader in any mainline denomination would be off the hook when they violate a foundational matter of sexual ethics? or teach others to do so. Other corollaries that follow here. Jesus repudiated inequities toward women in this context because in early Judaism, because a man was allowed multiple wives, he was not committing adultery against his wife to pick up another one. But Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. That's a way of underscoring that the monogamy requirement that had always been binding on women, they never had um, polyandry, multiple husbands in ancient Israel, but only polygyny as a form of polygamy, that is multiple wives allowed to husbands. 
The monogamy requirement that had always been binding on women in ancient Israel, Jesus said, would now be binding equally on men. So everything now is equal so far as that concerns. But, but note again the direction. What Jesus did not do is said, let's make it all equal by giving the same license all previously given to men, now to women as well. So women will also have the right for a form of polygyny, polyandry, uh, and will also be able to divorce their husbands for any cause. That isn't what Jesus said. Because Jesus also had in view the importance of sexual purity and this foundational dynamic of the two-ness of the sexes, limiting the number of partners to two. Okay, uh, the hook is about to come out, so I'm gonna cut some of my losses here. We'll see how far I get. Homosexual relationships also implied here, as we note, are worse than polygamous ones. I presume that the Church of England is not producing a report about accepting polygamy. Am I incorrect about that? Hopefully we're not yet at that point, but they might as well go to that point if they say we're going to be open-ended about the question of a male-female prerequisite because according to Jesus, it's the male-female prerequisite that is the creation-based, logic-based reason for rejecting a polyamorous union. The two-ness of the sexes is a foundation for limiting the number of partners to two. If the two-ness of the sexes is no longer significant, if that's no longer a prerequisite for sexual activity, then don't pretend that there's some sort of binding limitation to two persons of the sexual union anymore once you eliminate that prerequisite. The principle of the two-ness of the sexual bond is predicated on a foundational principle of the two-ness of the sexes. Therefore, it's not as significant as the foundation. It's a superstructure built on the foundation. Homosexual practice is a direct assault on the foundation itself. It says there is no male-female prerequisite. God doesn't care whether man and woman are involved in the union. Once you eliminate that, there's no basis for limiting the number of partners in a sexual union. You can love more than one other person concurrently. And yet the church seems unwilling to do, go to that point. So what we have here is we should have gone in order here. We should have first gone from our license regarding fornication and remarriage after divorce to then accepting polygamy. Then we should have accepted adult consensual incestuous unions which have a concern, incest laws have a concern, about putting two people together that are too much alike, structurally speaking, here as regards kinship. But as you know, likeness or sameness is more keenly felt in the case of sex or gender than it is as regards kinship, which is why you have some degree of license for incest in the patriarchal period that then gets closed off in the mosaic period. You never have any loopholes with regard to homosexual practice as you do with incest because there are none. At the foundation of creation, it's male and female, God created them. There's no loophole to close subsequently, whether, whether in the Mosaic period for incest law or in Jesus' day for polyamorous unions, because that's the core foundation. Uh, there are many other arguments, because of time I can't go into them all, that indicate what Jesus' view of homosexual practice would be. Uh, so memorize these points and these points. Uh, the reason why Jesus didn't have to speak directly to the issue of homosexual practice is simply because the witness of Scripture was clear. Hebrew Scriptures were quite clear about a male-female requirement to sexual unions. There's no Jew in, in, in period, centuries within the life of Jesus who advocates homosexual practice, much less engages in it. So for Jesus to talk at length about, hey, men, stop having sex with men here in Jewish Palestine, or women, stop having sex with women, they'd look at him and say, what? Who's doing that? Nobody's doing it. Move on to the next point, all right? We all agree with you there. So what Jesus does is close the remaining loopholes. That's what he focuses on. And in closing the remaining loopholes, and not wasting his time, says something about how Jesus views himself. He thought he could unilaterally amend the Constitution of Israel to make it more consistent uh, and coherent with the will of God in creation. Uh, and we know also that Jesus is not particularly averse to disagreeing with the broader culture when he does. So had he disagreed with the prevailing view in early Judaism, he certainly would have said something. So his silence must be read as agreeing with the overwhelming evidence presented in his own scriptures as to what God's will is in creation, which is the exact point confirmed directly in Mark 10 parallel Matthew 19. So there's no doubt about what Jesus' view is. All right, I do have to close. So, 
Let me just see if very quickly anything else I want to say. Let me just say quickly something about the woman caught in adultery as a way of closing here. That's often cited as a text where allegedly Jesus uh, claims that sexual matters aren't really important. We learn, need to learn to accept differences among each other. Okay? If that's the interpretation you received in the church, scratch that one out because that's 180 degrees opposed to what the text actually says. What Jesus does do is prevent the woman from being stoned. Actually, let me move on to this point here in the, in the slides. By the way, if you think Jesus doesn't care about sexual ethics, look at Matthew 5, where he talks about the other part in which he closes remaining loopholes is he says that God's, God's commands reach into your interior life. It's not just what you do outwardly, but what you entertain in your thought life that God can also hold you accountable for. And what does he say in between those two? If your hand, eye, or foot should threaten your downfall, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven maimed than to go into hell full-bodied. That would suggest what you do sexually does, in fact, matter. You could say that that's unloving, but then you would have to say that Jesus is unloving, which sort of inverts everything, right? Since we understand what love is on the basis of looking at what Jesus does and says. So again, the woman caught in adultery. What does Jesus say? He does say, don't stone the woman. Why not stone the woman? Because if you stone the woman caught in adultery, you can make a movie with a title like this, Dead People Don't Repent. That's the problem. You kill somebody, you foreclose the opportunity of repentance. And Jesus thinks that something much greater is at stake here than loss of life in this world. And that is loss of life eternally in relation to God. That's what's at stake here. So he says to the woman, go and from now on, no longer be sinning. Now what is meant by that? We know what is meant by that because the same line appears in John 5.14. And it's followed by, lest something worse happen to you. And what is that something worse? In the context of John 5, the something worse is not inheriting eternal life. So Jesus' warning to the woman is, if you should continue in adultery in a serial, unrepentant way, what's at stake here is not a capital sentence in this life. I'm going to hold that in abeyance for the sake of your repentance. What's at stake here is the loss of life forever. Okay, I did lie. I do want to make one final point, if I could. And this is to make it a little more personal. Here's what distinguished Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't care whether the sinners and tax collectors were going to hell. Jesus did. Jesus and the Pharisees agreed that both the sinners, meaning primarily sexual sinners, and the tax collectors who were known for their exploitation economically of fellow Jews, complicitous with an oppressive foreign power, with a justly deserved reputation of collecting many times over what they were required to collect and pocketing it for their own personal self-aggrandizement. Liberation theologians would have a field day with them. Liberals would have a field day with them nowadays. And in fact, all Christians would have a field day with them. They are the chief economic oppressors in first century Palestine. We know what Jesus' stance was on economic oppression. Jesus was well within the trajectory of the prophets on that score. He did not dilute God's message on that account but rather intensified it. And yet, he reached out aggressively in love to the biggest violators of that demand with regard to material possessions. We never conclude from that that Jesus softened the demand on the use of material possessions consistent with God's will and compassion. On the contrary, we assume that Jesus' outreach to the tax collectors was to call them to repentance so that they would not be excluded from the very kingdom of God that Jesus was proclaiming. So why should we then conclude with the parallel case of Jesus reaching out to the sexual sinners that Jesus didn't think that the sexual sin would get you into any serious trouble? On the contrary, the coupling of it with the tax collectors indicates exactly what he thought about the matter. They were indeed at high risk from being excluded from the kingdom. And this is the point in part about the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. As you know, the younger son goes out with half the inheritance 
and he squanders it on himself, including squandering it, Luke says, on prostitutes. Something then happens to him. Remember what that is? Some spiritual moment where he decides this may not be workable. Namely, he runs out of money. And when you're eating with the pigs, it's remarkable how your mindset begins to change. Right? This maybe wasn't such a good move after all. And he says, you know what? I'm not even worthy anymore, given what I've done, to be called my father's son. I would just go back and ask to be part of the hired help, and maybe, just maybe, he will accept me. He's not going back to reclaim the other half of the inheritance. He's not going back to brag about what he did earlier. He's returning repentant. In Hebrew, shuv, return, is a metaphor for repentance. So when he comes back, it's an image of repentance. And the father knows that in the deeper sense, not the literal sense, but in the metaphorical sense, that the one who is lost has now been found because he has repented of the life that he had been living. And as you know, not everybody was equally happy with the father's decision to throw a celebration, right? Who was not so happy about this? The older brother. Now, when I became a Christian at the age of 17, and read that parable for the first time, that text hit me like a ton of bricks. And here's why. Literally and figuratively, I was the older brother. I had three younger sisters. My mother had five children in five years. I was in the upper middle class, for which alone she thinks she's going to heaven. I say, Mom, I don't see that really in Scripture. But having had two children, I'm half willing to concede the point. Fifth child is looking at, you know, how well all the rest of her siblings have done. So to, you know, to have an identity, she began moving in the opposite direction from the rest of the family. She got involved in substance abuse, um, swearing at my parents, lots of conflict at home, sexuality, immorality issues, and so on. I thought, I hate what my sister is doing to my family. Then one day, at the age of 12, 13, she ran away from home. And I thought, good riddance. Now we'll finally have peace at home. Instead, every day I would wake up in the morning before I went to school and hear my father wailing. And my mother as well. I had to go to school like that every day for several months. I thought my parents were going to crack up. And I can't tell you the degree of hate that welled up in my heart for my younger sister because of what I saw her do to my family. And when she was brought back by the police three months later, she didn't come back willingly, police brought her back from several states south of where we lived. Instead of me rejoicing that she had been found, I wanted nothing to do with her. I hated my sister. So when I became a Christian two years later and read this text, I knew exactly who I was in this story. Important thing about parable, location, location, location. It's all like real estate buying. Where you place yourself in the parable is critical, and I was the older brother. And I just couldn't get past the point that the older brother was wrong. I wrestled with this for a long time in my spiritual journey until I finally realized that God had pretty much accepted and forgiven me as much as he had forgiven my younger sister. And that's when a whole different outlook on grace developed in me. And how I came to see from that point on my relationship to others who I think may be offending the word of God. Even as I realized that in my own thought life and in many other ways I offend God and need likewise to have brothers and sisters come alongside me, not to lord it over me, but to come in alongside me and to help me. Because you know what love means? We know what the second greatest commandment is, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but you know what the context for that is? It's the verse and a half preceding it. You shall not hate your neighbor. You shall not take revenge against your neighbor. You shall not hold a grudge against your neighbor. 
And if your neighbor does wrong, you shall reprove your neighbor, lest you incur guilt for failing to warn them. For failing to warn them, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you claim that you love your neighbor, but they are engaged in behavior that is injurious to their relationship to God, and you do nothing, you do not love them, whatever your affect is. Love entails reproof when individuals engaged in behavior doing what they shouldn't do. Jesus echoes this point in Luke 17, where he says, if your brother or sister sins, even if they sin seven times a day, if at the end of that they say, I repent, you are to forgive. But the repentance is critical, not because it's about you, but because it's about reclaiming them. And that's a full orb meaning of what love is. So what we've been proclaiming here today is not hate, but the exact proclamation that Jesus gave to sexual sinners and economic sinners. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Thank you for your time.